Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 176. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cashflow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cashflow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you have decided to tune in today. You know, the interesting thing about being a real estate investor is that you often have to hang out by yourself um, doing your own work. But here's one of the interesting things, is that there are so many of us that we don't ever create enough excuses to get together and hang out, and you never know the cool people that you're going to meet I think you're going to enjoy today's guest because he is clearly a real estate investor who's accomplished a significant uh, amount of different things in various different areas, and I think you're going to learn a lot. I think one of the things that you're definitely going to learn is the lesson that I've said before, where you start isn't necessarily where you have to stay, and that there's growth all along your career in various different ways. Today's guest is Matt. Owens. You may know him as the founder of OCG Properties, and it's a company that specializes in equity and cash flowing real estate investments. Now, you know I like the cash flowing part. He's done over 450 flips, and get this, he's actually a CPA. He somehow enjoys taxes and that paperwork in some way, shape, or form that I can't even begin to completely understand. He's raised over $25 million in capital, and we actually play in a very similar marketplace together. That's right. You can share the same sandbox. There's enough for everybody. So I think we're going to learn a lot today. So let's listen. Matt, you there? Hey, what's going on, Jay? How are you? I'm doing great, man. Just just getting over uh, uh, a lack of sleep last night from a uh, new, newborn at home. So yeah, yeah, I was going to say, how's the, the you know, it's always about uh, the, those kids. They change everything. And you know it's it's pretty amazing. That's it, it's great to be able to spend time with them when I when I want to and things like that because of the cash flow streams that are created from doing this business. You know it's pretty amazing. So I I, I enjoy that and having that time freedom sometimes, which you know as you know we don't always have. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. So here here's the interesting thought process. If you did say all you know four hundred plus flips etc. before the kid. Typically, having a child puts a fire under your butt and makes you work that much harder. So I'm kind of curious, how many are you going to do now? You got a kid, man. You got to really work. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, the the goal here is to try to set up, you know, as best as best of a system as you can and having the right team members to be able to make it so that you don't have to be the guy involved. And really, the, the biggest challenge that I've had is getting things off my plate and delegating as much as possible and um, trying to get that system set up so that, you know, I can spend more time with, with my kid because it's not just about the real estate investments. If you don't understand the system and trying to put it together, you're going to run out of time real fast as we all know. (laughs) Yeah. And I think many of our listeners probably have already experienced that to some degree. Now, before we get too much further, We've got to ask this. The I ask everybody the same question towards the beginning. Okay. I look at at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So you know, you can say Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, what have you. They 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 are today's entrepreneurs, and here's why: superheroes go around, they get dressed up, they they occasionally put on a mask and, and become someone else. They have this alter ego that goes around saving people right? Uh, From their own mess and making the world better. That's what they do. And I think entrepreneurs are the same way. However, just like superheroes, they, before they were super, before they got bit by the spider, before their planet blew up or whatever happened, they were just regular, ordinary people in some way, shape, or form. So what I want to know is before 
the you were Matt Owens CPA syndicator uh, uh, group leader and 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 all of these things you know multifamily investor flipping houses. Who is Matt Owens? Ha! Huh. Interesting. That's that's pretty funny. My my background actually. I went to. Um, I lived in Torrance my whole life in, in Southern California and actually went up to school at um, UC Santa Barbara and uh, partied a lot there, by the way. It's not really a school you can uh, study from home at, you know, you have to go to uh, the library to get something done, you know. So, but um, actually, I graduated with a degree in economics and, and emphasis in accounting and, uh, uh, you know, wanted to become an architect, but they didn't have that school there. They didn't have architecture school there. So, I decided to go into accounting for some reason against the advice <laughs> of my father, which was also a CPA, saying, don't do it. You're an idiot. What are you thinking? You know, this business is crazy. And <laughs> so I did it anyways and um, got my CPA license and was working for a couple CPA firms and uh, primarily doing audit and tax on large real estate clients. And those real estate clients were so large that, you know, I'm sitting at the table with different CEOs of the companies and the presidents and things like that and helping them, you know, de decrease their, their taxes, increase their bottom line and, and, you know, help them with their internal controls, you know, I'm, I'm there for that function, but they're talking about buying multi-million dollar buildings and just, you know, the owners are just saying, yeah, no problem. Go ahead and go ahead and buy it to the, to the presidents and the CEOs to, that are, you know, pulling the trigger on those things. And without, without really batting an eye and I'm going, you know, I'm sitting on the wrong side of the table here. You know, <laughs> I'm making these guys all this money. That <laughs> is what I felt like. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working for pennies comparatively, you know? So, um, yeah. so after that, um, I actually went and quit my CPA firm job after getting some education. And then, um, at that point I went through and, uh, and, and just started doing real estate as best I could. Um, I bought up my first deal under contract that I was going to make 30 grand on and, and I quit and I was done and everybody in the world's going, what are you thinking? You're crazy. My mom, right. my whole family, you know, of course, but, um, you know, and then that's, that's how it all started. But, um, it was definitely something that I knew I had to do something different. I was bored at what I was doing. And I realized mm -hmm. after reading some books like, you know, rich dad, poor dad and thinking grow rich and things like that, that I was making the wrong kind of income. And that's when I said, forget it. I need to quit. I need to do something else. Exactly. Makes perfect sense to me. Now, you you, <laughs> you have – we keep hearing this, the same book. So, by the way, I just want everybody to, to please hear that. There's not too much deviation between the books that many of our guests have said. This is what made a difference. But I like the fact that you said you were bored. Uh, what, why were you bored? Most people would be excited to be doing the thing just to have a seat at the table. You were clearly at the table. Well, you know, it, it was interesting because, you know, I was working right under the partners of the company, um, and, and primarily heading up a lot of their audit, their audit functions. And, uh, it was interesting because I, you know, I could do an audit in 40 hours that they give you a 70 hour budget for, um, you know, you really don't get any major benefit at all for um, other than maybe a very, very small commission for bringing in any clients or expanding that side. Um, I could have worked my way up, but I, I looked at the managers and the partners and, and how much they were working and they were basically stuck in their position until they wanted to retire. And, you know, I, I didn't want that life. And I was honestly looking at the accounting side going, I need to go talk to people. I can't, I can't do this anymore. This is, the same thing over and over and over again. And I wasn't challenged anymore. And so when I wasn't challenged, then it's really hard to, to gain any enjoyment out of it in the long run. Yeah. You know, I've heard it said uh, oftentimes that people say that they have 20 years of experience. I've often thought that, no, what you really have is one year experience repeated 20 times. Right. Exactly. Well, I can tell you that I got six years of experience and six months when the market crashed in 08. So that was, you know, great experience, <laughs> all, I think. So. <laughs> Got it. Uh, well, let, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. As you're going through this transition, there's definitely a person or two who could probably relate to you. You know, maybe they're bored right now. You know, they're listening to you on the way to work today and going, man, I'm bored just like Matt. But he quit his job. 
How on earth did he get the courage to do that? You know, it, it, it comes down to, to self-confidence and the ability to know that you can do this. And, and I think with education, you build that self-confidence. And no matter how uh, misguided it may be, <laughs> when your mentality can do great things for you. And so um, I knew that if I was thrown to the wolves, I'd be forced to do it. At the same time, I knew that was the hardest way to go, which I think is important to challenge yourself. Um, if you're able to get where you're at now, it's a matter of breaking the mold of what everybody in their in your life has told you that is the right way to do it. And that may not be the right way. I, I can tell you that I haven't felt alive. Uh, I didn't feel alive when I was working at my old CPA firm as comparative to now where where everything, like the time goes by in three seconds a day, I swear, it's like immediately gone. And I don't, I don't, it, you don't have to, you don't sit there thinking, wow, is it really nine o'clock already in the morning? Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it feels like it's, it's only nine o'clock. It's been, uh, uh, and when you're working for the CPA firm or a different company, you're, you're going, I, I can't believe it's, it's only nine o'clock. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I try to, I, you know, you, you're one of the few people who's actually expressed this and, and, and where the audience can hear it. I, I, it's weird to me the same thing. It's like I wake up by the time I felt like I blinked twice, the day is gone. How is that possible? We we I just started. I, I'm I'm still accomplishing things, but you're speaking to something that I, I too feel very viscerally, completely, all the way down. I feel engaged in life, period, in a completely different way. There there is no such thing as checked out. I I, I care about a whole lot more things and it it's like I, I don't know. It, it's like it's the difference between like black and white and color. Mm -hmm. And and it's amazing because I think that comes down, to, you know, to desire because, you know, you mentioned something important. I'm still accomplishing things. It's like when you have that desire to get to your passive cash flow goal where all of your expenses are covered by cash flow and you're financially free, then and that's all you it's what you want to focus on to get there you can't stop accomplishing things until you get there. And so you start to get into a pattern where you, you, you want to keep accomplishing, want to keep accomplishing and learning more constantly, you know? And I think that's, it's like a, it's like a hunger for life at that point. You know, it's kind of interesting. And, <laughs> indeed. Interesting. Indeed. Now, one of the things that you said that may have been a, a roadblock for some people, there's like, when we're talking about quoting a job, it's like, you got to have the self-confidence, the ability to know, well, and then the, I think the most challenging thing that you said was thrown to the wolves. I knew if I didn't throw myself to the wolves, I wasn't going to do this. I want you to expand upon that a little bit because I think I know what you mean, but I want to hear it in your words. No, definitely. I mean, I, I completely understand. It's 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 like a it's like if I'm in my nice, comfy job where I'm getting a check every month and uh, verse and and have a four hundred one k. All of my family is is supporting me because I have a quote unquote good job, you know, uh, and uh, and you know I'm saving for my future. Even if you know technically and in reality, it's like a month to month type thing because you're never making enough money to really survive and and live the way you want to live. Um, even if you do have some savings, you're still scrounging by. Um, but uh, it's that comfort level, though of having that paycheck and versus saying, Hey, I am going to rely on myself to pay my own way. I'm not going to rely on, on another outside company to do that for me. And I'm going to go create something and throwing yourself to the wolves is basically saying, I don't know where my next paycheck is going to be. I don't know where that comfort level is going to come. And, and I still don't know if it's fully coming, you know, so but because once you have money, you got to protect it and you have to you have to put it in the right places. But, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, you start to learn to live with that uncomfortability over time. But in the beginning, it feels like, oh, my God, everything's on me. I have to do it all. And um, and otherwise, all my family and everybody that I care about um, is going to laugh at me and I just threw everything away. That's what your mentality goes through when you're doing that. But at the same time, the benefits of doing that, even if you fail, which you only fail if you if you stop getting up again, 
you know, there's a big difference in some of those books between temporary defeat and failure. But even if you, you take a falter and you come and you, uh, get back up again, it's going to happen and it's going to happen many times and you should be thankful for when it happens. But that's how you really expand and learn and, and be able to create something for yourself. Um, and I think that's what I'm saying by thrown to the wolves, meaning, uh, it's on me a hundred percent and everybody else thinks that I'm crazy, you know? <laughs> and- <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. You know what? I, I, if, if you listen really closely, Matt, right now, I think we can hear the blood pressure of somebody going up as they listen to this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're like, oh no. I mean, you used some very, uh, some, some, so you use the F word, man. You said fail. That's, yeah, that's yeah, it. That's, yeah, that's true. Sorry. Oh, no, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> but the concept that you also said is you said temporary defeat. And I think it's important that we all realize that that experience, that failure event you just witnessed firsthand, front row seat, um, is temporary. It is a temporary process, but you also said you should be grateful for it. I would love to know your perspective now. I'm assuming you failed at least once, but you're also <laughs> saying we should be grateful for it. Why? Well, I mean, I can tell you when the market crashed in 08, and, and I would say this is a major temporary defeat on my part, where when the market crashed, I had just got into real estate maybe a year before and wasn't really focused on market cycles, was trying to focus on flipping and making money and things like that. And, you know, I basically took a gigantic hit, um, took out money on my credit cards to make sure all my investors got paid back. And then at the same time, you know, went and split partnerships off and things like that and went and started working from home for myself for a while. And, uh, you know, then, but at that point, I was fully, before that crash occurred, I was relying on banks over and over and over again for my systems, for buying properties and renovating them and selling them. And then, you know, when everything crashed and the banking system stopped, it taught me how to raise private capital and how to never rely on banks again. It taught me how to um, buy properties cheap um, and, and understand the economic cycles that are that are occurring at different parts of the cycle and how much how important it is to pay attention to those things. I probably got a, a 10 year education in an eight month to one year period of time right. from that temporary defeat that occurred. And since then I've flipped over 450 houses. And so you start to look at that that temporary defeat and what that does to propel you into major success in the future. And so, and after that, on top of that, realizing that I came out of that okay, and I maneuvered and found a way to make it work and make it happen and make my investors happy at the same time, you realize that the confidence level that that gives you is unbelievable. It, it gives you a whole nother level of you know, the worst thing in the world could that you think of could happen to you and you can come out fine. And that means that nothing can take you down anymore because you have that mentality. Exactly. There's so much learned uh, from, I mean, I think too many of us spend a lot of time avoiding being knocked down when the true strength is learning how to get back up. And that's exactly what you're saying. Uh, something, I mean, I'm assuming you didn't script it. If you had been given a pen, you wouldn't have wrote the story that way. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> right. But having now experienced it, having the story already written in hindsight, you can go, well, because this, this, and this happened, these are the things I am now enabled and capable of doing. And that, to me, is the essence of, of a lot of why we do this. It's also the barrier to entry, you know, not only to real estate, but to business in general. Now, you you also brought up something and, and I whoo this one is I think this is an ongoing one because you said once you have it you have to protect it because we spend so much time thinking oh if I just go get it just go get it once I get it I'm done yay but <laughs> once you have it you have to protect it share with us a little bit of how you came to know about that <laughs> well it's funny because. You know, you start doing a lot of flips and you start making money doing that. And then you start expanding and you start making more money 
And then you start to go through and do more flips. And, you know, like right now I'm doing about five, five flips a month um, on the single family home side. And I'm buying multifamily build, buildings, typically one a quarter. Um, and, and as you expand and get to that level, you realize that the money that you do have, you know, actually in comparison to the amount of deals that you're doing um, isn't as significant as you thought. And if something major goes wrong, you could be at risk. And so you have to dial it back, put some towards cash flow investments, diversify your portfolios in different ways um, into different asset classes with different operators in different markets um, to be able to keep a steady cash flow stream coming in at the same time, keeping it 100% separate from your other business and and the the machine that you're building that may have higher risk because of just the million parts that are going on within it. And so um, when uh, when you're doing that, I think it's really important to look at um, the stability factor and keep a focus on what you need on a monthly basis to cover all of your expenses and be financially free and make sure that is taken care of along with reserves and things like that. And then at that point, you can slowly build on that cash flow and at the same time, uh, run your business as, as high as you'd like to make it, you know, as long as you're not personally responsible for it, you know, as far as your, your, your other money there, you know? Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's important to do proper asset structuring and things like that to make sure that you have things in the right entities and, and stuff like that to protect yourself. Now you're starting to talk like a CPA again. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. It's all good. It's all good. We don't want to put people to sleep. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Let's, let's keep them engaged. Nice. Um, but what you're saying is absolutely important. And at the end of the day, it becomes the foundation of your, we'll say, empire. And it could crumble. Uh, it's not always promised perfect or guaranteed. Uh, you could... Get yourself into a situation to where you are, quote unquote, out of the rat race and you can still find yourself back in uh, mm -hmm. if some of the things that you're talking about are not uh, absolutely done. So with all of that being said, um, there's this point in every superhero's journey, you know, where they go, all right, here's where I'm from. OK, cool. This happened to me. Wonderful. But they make this conscious decision. I'm going to go help other people. I can help other people. I'm going to go do that. I want to know where that superhero moment for you comes in to where you you actually go, you know what, this is, this, is, this is who I'm now going to be. Yeah, I was this Matt, but now Matt's going to be this guy, and here's what we are going to go out there and create and do. And I believe that I can do this for other people. Where did that come from for you? Well, you know, when sitting down with clients as as a CPA, uh, you start to you start to really see all of the different problems financially that that people go through and and that people have, and the lack of financial education out there um, from the vast majority of the population. And uh, seeing seeing that aspect, it really makes you want to be put into a position where you can teach other people these different avenues of success and you can teach other people uh, how to actually become financially free and change their mindset from what they've always been taught um, which is primarily financially based from you know bigger companies and things like that and so what's what's interesting is that you know for me right now you know i go and i help people invest in real estate I invest with other people and bring on partners for for different different aspects. I bring in debt investors and help them create cash flow uh, streams. But the way I'm able to do that is by teaching. If I go and I run my real estate investment clubs, um, where we have different topics that we bring up and educate the the general population on, um, you know, different facets of real estate investing, including the entire financial side too. Then, by doing that, I not only get to teach people and get to actually um, show other people how to do this business and help empower them to do the same thing on the financial side or in business or in real estate. Then I also gain. A ton of other new investors for myself, and we all make money together. So 
when you say superhero, I look at it as more of a collaborative effort between everybody where, you know, I just, I have a knowledge base that enables people to make a, a cash flow stream. And I have an education on, on the financial side that a lot of people don't necessarily have. And there's different levels of it, of course. There's people that are far smarter than I am at, at this, of course. Um, but by, innate, by taking that education, I can go and help people in a completely different way that most people are not capable of learning on their on their own or or have the resources to do that so um so that's kind of my envisioned idea and you know the end game for me i'd really love to be able to start a uh, like a financial education nonprofit organization um and and be able to just teach people because it's really i think that is extreme joy to be able to see how other people can grow and achieve uh in the long run you know I think you, you you might have some people who are willing to help you with that particular mission, my friend. Um, and we'll we'll leave them nameless. We'll just say that you could be talking to them right now. Um, with <laughs> nice. that being said, some of the things that uh, I, that you just mentioned are, are things like real estate clubs. I, I, I'm going to ask a question that you are somewhat biased on, uh, and by saying, are these clubs? I mean, there's they're everywhere. Of course. What, but are they really worth going to to actually if I'm going to try to figure out a way to learn and or more importantly meet some of the people that need that I need to know is it worth going to cuz there I I can t- I know firsthand there's at least one or two hundred that aren't Okay guys yes we're going to get you to the answer in a second But I thought this would be a good time to let you know that we recently created something that you might want to know about. If you are trying to figure out where investors are hiding, if you're struggling to find them, I've got a free resource for you. It's 39 perfect places, 39 perfect places to find investors every day. You can go pick that up absolutely free at cashflowdiary.com forward slash 39 dash perfect dash places. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash 39 dash perfect dash places. And that's the number three and nine. Because it really doesn't matter how many or how much you know money you might have yourself. You know at some point you're going to run out and you need the strategies to find more people to talk to. And at the end of the day, they're everywhere. So let's see what Matt had to say about the hundreds of groups that you could be going to. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I've been to a ton of them. And I can tell you that, you know, there's a lot of them that are not worth going to. And, um, and that's primarily because they're chop shops, you know, they're, they're coming in and, and uh, selling you the the, the ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollar boot camp, where there's a speaker that's very biased on um, on what he's telling you because he's trying to sell you something, and it's a set up from the start. It's basically all set up to 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 get you to buy something, you know. So um, versus the ones that are more educational, you know, and they're all twenty to twenty five bucks to go, and all of them you can actually get some um, some good networking. Um, from. Uh, but at the same time, you want to go to the ones that are educational in nature and, and don't have that kind of sales pitch atmosphere, which is what the, if I was to go in my investment clubs and just try to pitch people stuff, there's no, there's no way that I can build trust by doing that. If I just teach with no incentive for, and no sales pitch whatsoever, then I'm truly teaching and the people that want to work with me will come to me that want to work with me. You don't have to sell anything. You just have to teach. And so what's interesting is that, you know, I run a a group of investors called For Investors by Investors, um, which we have about 15 chapters throughout Southern California and now in some in different markets of the U.S. Um, I run the Long Beach Real Estate Investment Club and uh, and the Manhattan Beach Real Estate Investment Club for Phoebe, which stands for For Investors by Investors, um, and uh, our entire basis be- behind our club is there's no sales pitch allowed. You have to just teach. We do panel discussions, just do Q and A's with the audience. 
We do all types of things like that. And though, and there's other ones just like that, that you can go to. And there's some that do partial sales and that type of thing. So um, get recommendations from other investors that have been to them and see what they like. And uh, that's probably one of the best ways for um, to find the good ones out there. <laughs> yeah, that's it, which was actually going to be the question is, how how can I tell you know, when I'm I'm just looking at a you know page on Meetup or or, or Facebook invite, how do, how can I tell? What are the telltale signs that you've seen that say, yeah, this one's worth it. This one is probably a skip. You know, that's that's a real tough one because I mean, there's reviews which which help. You know, but um, you know, a lot of people you you get people going that um uh that that may not be sophisticated and may be happy with the sales pitch. And that's all they do is go to those types of meetings anyways, you know? So, um, and they're happy buying the $16,000, you know, boot camp thing, you know? So, um, but, uh, when, when it comes down to it, you look for those reoccurring meetings that have consistent people going on a monthly basis. Um, and that's a good, a, a good way to do it. Some of them actually have PDF files and things like that up on there that you can read through. Um, you can read those reviews and see what people are saying about them. So those are the types of things. It's, it's not super easy to do that, but you know, definitely I think the best way is to get recommendations, go to a few of them, see how you like it, or if it's a sales pitch or not, and start crossing them off the list, you know, but the value of the education and the networking, when you do find the ones that make sense that that don't sell you anything um is unsurpassed so yep yeah, that well let but let's be clear when you say because you've mentioned this a, a number of times at some point you education isn't always free you've right. got to do some there's got to be some sort of an investment somewhere somehow so are you saying you're completely against buying any sort of education help help, help us understand oh, a little bit oh. more what you mean Absolutely not. Education, I'm sorry, I I didn't mean to come across that way. Actually, education is one of the most important things that you can do. You have to continue educating yourself. Um, But when you, what I'm saying is typically you have um, some, some guys going up there um, and, and some, some groups that are selling you properties or selling you different uh, uh, investments or, you know, boot camps and things like that. And, you know, it's very hard to find the good ones and there are good ones to pay for. And I've paid for them before as well. And I think there's big value in a lot of that education, but getting, doing your research on, on those, those products and those investors and understanding the happiness of the other people that have, have done business with them and doing your due diligence on those people before buying I think is very important and I think, um, you know, is of great value and, and, you know, cost is a big factor as well. You know, you might be able to go through and, you know, Jay, I know you have a lot of like very low cost, uh, uh, education. That's amazing that I've actually watched multiple times, you know, and, (laughs) and, and it's pretty funny because like, uh, I, I look at that and I'm going, you know, this is amazing that you, you, you give it away for this price. It's like, I mean, you're just not even making money on it. You're basically going through and saying, this is, you know, here's some great education for people, you know, you're paying for your, your production costs, you know? So I look at that and that's great education, but you know, I don't, I don't like the stuff that's might be 16, $20,000 that is, you know, like a, a, a big, one of those big real estate investment chop houses that you don't really, you know, uh, get much off of. And I bought some that I read through books in a weekend that I spent a grand on and, got no value out of you know what i mean <laughs> i i so. do i do i was wanting you to more articulate it so that that everyone else can also learn because if you've already been there it's one thing to you know if you've been to a restaurant before you kind of know what's good on the menu and what to right. eat and what not to eat but if you are right now approaching your real estate career and you don't know uh, but yet they can talk to you today and hear your perspective. Hey, yes, not everything is bad, but here's how you can choose and navigate your way through this maze because this this real estate thing isn't, I mean, there are times where I wish it was simpler. Like, you know, if I wanted to learn how to make baskets, it's very easy. Here's the 12-step program to go make baskets. Now, mind you, if you know me, I am not the craft person, nor am I manually dexterative to where I could actually make a basket. That is not me. Right. But that, that's simpler to explain. There are so many facets that are so much, I'll say, personal growth that's required to become 
the real estate investor. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and I can tell you, um, you know, I, I've spent a, about 500 bucks on a weekend course before that has completely changed my business in a weekend where I learned absolutely, you know, a ton about seller financing and changed my whole perspective. And I think that's very important for people to continue, even if they're doing well in real estate right now and, and starting to, you know, starting to do really, you know, some good flips or some different, you know, strategies. Um, it's important to, continue that because uh you don't realize how how many weapons you can add to the uh, add to your repertoire when you're uh when when you get educated and continue that education yeah weapons of math destruction <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> nice. i'm sorry i couldn't help myself i couldn't <laughs> help myself uh anyway it so uh, let me let me ask you this in your time as a uh, real estate investor, and especially since you're in front of a lot of people in clubs, etc. What would you say is the number one thing that prevents people from actually hitting their stride in real estate investing? You know, I think it's fear and inaction for the most part. Um, people don't continue pushing forward and and continue to uh, do what they. Sh- do action items towards the achievement of their goals without um, you never do that without problems and, 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 and things occurring with chat without those challenges that come up and people stop because of those challenges. They don't have confidence in themselves. And I think that's probably one of the biggest facets. Uh, also, you know, uh, people have a tendency to over educate and overthink things that, you know, come up with every problem that could occur. And I think sometimes dumb luck and just taking action can be the fastest teaching tool that you can have. Uh, of course, getting a good mentor or something like that that can tell you how to not be an idiot, you know, sometimes would be great, you know, right. so um, and not do something really stupid that costs you a lot of money. Um, just getting that outside advice at the same time as pulling the trigger on something, you know, that they think will work. Um, I think that's one of the biggest, uh, you know. X factors to stop people. Indeed, the that unknown. I want to try to understand if it if the seller does this on a Wednesday, what should I do next Tuesday when it rains? It doesn't matter. Write the offer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I get a little crazy with that sometimes because it it feels that way. You know, it, it definitely feels that way. Here's a question: How many times have you written an offer for something? But and and like, well, let me ask it differently. In order for you to write an offer, how much work are you going to do before you actually write the offer? Um, depending if it's a single family home. Yeah, let's leave it at single family. I understand commercial. Once we go to the commercial and cell phone towers and all the other stuff that we do, it be it's a whole different ballgame. But for now, let's just just okay. Single family. So on the, on the single family home side, uh, you know, I'm looking at. Um, a, a, what, what are typically, what we typically do is we run the numbers as best we can. First, we're looking at market value. We put in a preliminary rehab number based off of the square footage and, you know, very, very rough numbers. And then we come in and we look at whether it'll rent for as well. Um, we look at, you know, put all of our costs in there. So we have a little quick Excel schedule that takes about three to five seconds to go put them all in, you know, and then you look at the market values. Um, if we find ones that look, make sense, we send somebody by it, give us a ver- another preliminary rehab estimate. So not tied down in detail yet. And um, they get back to us and they let us know that if we think they think our, our rental amounts are, are on par with our comps and things like that based on the neighborhood. And then we make the offer. And that's it. If we get it under contract, we have our contractor go back out there and do a full walk through a bit of the, of the property, even though our contracts are typically you know, no contingency period. Um, and you know, a few times it's, it's bit us a few times we made more money off of it, you know? So you just have, make sure you always build in reserves and, you know, it can't be a perfect, a perfect thing. You have to kind of take it based on what your intuition is sometimes and what the numbers show initially, and then tie down those numbers after you can get more data. So, 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 so you're saying you, you don't need 12 months of utility bill history to write the offer? 
<laughs> no, you just put two hundred dollars a month and just put it in there, and say that's it. <laughs> but but that's that but but Matt, that's not accurate. How how what if it's more? You know, you've been talking to too many engineers. I'm telling you right now. So <laughs> I know, I know, and we're making fun, and somebody's getting offended right now. But yeah, hey, I, we're also trying to make a point. It doesn't matter. You're going to do the due diligence anyway. Write the offer. You and, the, and here's another question. I'm just curious. How many of the uh, offers that you have written have changed before they got to closing? Before they got to closing? Oh, you know, not many of them, honestly. I mean, uh, on my side, uh, we we typically have an understanding up front of what those um, what the numbers are. So, but in the beginning they changed consistently, you know? So if you're, you know, if, if you have a major problem that with a property, that's the only time it's really going to change. If something major comes up that you can't deal with, if it's a couple thousand dollars here and there, it's not going to be the end of the world. You're not going to go change the offer for that, you know, especially if you're dealing with banks, but if you're dealing with outside people, definitely can go and, and make those changes. Right, so, right. I was just trying to underscore that at the beginning, it does change because you don't know what you don't know and you haven't gotten your feet, you, you just don't know, but right. you still wrote the offer and just changed it later to make it fit the new information that you discovered. And because I find that there's, there's a ton of people who are trying to write the perfect offer, right? So that as soon as they submit it, the only thing they hear is yes, because they're so afraid of no. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, that, <laughs> what world is that realistic? And, and, and honestly, think about the mentality of that also when that occurs you're automatically thinking that it's going to be a going to be a no being afraid you have to be confident when you make your offers i don't care if the realtor doesn't know about it or not you be confident and you submit as many offers that you think are reasonable for you to make a profit if you're not making a profit then you know you have to do it it can't be it, it, you can't do that deal it can't be emotional at all it has to be strictly by the numbers and that's the hardest thing i think for beginning investors to understand about making offers and getting these properties if the numbers don't work, then the numbers don't work. You can't do it then. You're going to lose money. So um, it, it shouldn't be an emotional decision, which is very hard for people when they're dealing with larger sums of money, of course. you know. <laughs> right, right. And, and larger is relative. I mean, I know what I used to consider large when I first started is now not large. Right, exactly. <laughs> but my first multifamily deal was was definitely scary to to pull that trigger off. I can tell you, and that was a large deal for me. You know, so right. uh, say so you just go get bigger over time. You know, so indeed, you get used to it. So for those that have been listening this far and and are, are probably going, okay, I, I want to meet this Matt guy in person, or or you know, I I got to do something. Could you tell us how to to track you down and maybe some of the share with us some of the events you guys got going on and that's coming up that we could be a part of? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, well, my my company is OCG Properties and the website's ocgproperties.com. And uh, we basically help people with uh, th that financial education. We help them with the, 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 the tax understanding, even though I don't do tax returns anymore. It's not any fun. Trust me. That's why, I, that's why I'm a real estate investor now, right? So um, and uh, and basically, we we help people with all all of those types of types of avenues, as well as strategic plans with with their uh, their strategies. You can go to our website and check us out, um, or you can go to one of our investment clubs, which is strictly education and no, like I mentioned, no sales pitch. Um, I mentioned before I, I run the Long Beach Investment Club, and on third we do the last Thursday of the month in Long Beach at the the Grand Long Beach Event Center. Um, where on June 23rd, we or June 25th, I apologize, is uh, the U.S. and global economy, the good and the bad and the ugly. So that should be an interesting topic, which, as you, as you know, I learned from the last crash. Um, and on June 9th in Manhattan Beach, uh, we have uh, on Tuesday, June 9th, raising private capital. So that's a huge value add for, um, for investors that are coming up. And I think that's going to be a, a great strategy to um, – to utilize. So um, that being said, um, you can go to meetup.com and type in FIBI, or you can go to forinvestorsbyinvestors.com and see our different chapters and uh, and find us from there. So that's where that's where you can find us. Excellent. Well, I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time. But before we go, I, I've got one final question. Yes. Um, 
if say someone's right now, they're, maybe they're standing outside the superhero store. They're about to pick up their outfit, their cape for the first time. They think, man, I can do this. Maybe I can fly like Matt too. I, I can do, I can have my secret decoder ring and actually save some people. But they're still feeling a little hesitant. They're still feeling a little un- unsure. Will people actually do business with me? They, they, will anyone ever accept an offer? Is this actually going to happen? All of those questions that I'm sure you've answered for yourself in various different ways. What would you say to that person knowing what you know now? I would say that the, the best way to get over that fear is to continue your education, know that you will have temporary defeat and it will teach you more than you've ever learned before. But at the same time, go back, write down your entire plan, what your end goal is going to be and, and how you plan on getting there in detail. And that will give you enough confidence to be able to go out and say, that's it. This is my plan. I'm going to go do it. Writing down your end goal and how you plan on achieving it the, the, in as much detail as you can imagine at this point will be one of the biggest strengthening points of your own self-confidence that you can do to be able to quit your job and get out of the rat race and put on that cape. Yes, I love it. I definitely appreciate you taking the time to invest with us here at the Cashflow Diary. Thanks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what? It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means it's go over to the website, OCG Properties. It means look up Phoebe. If you are local, you're probably going to find Matt at one of those events. And most importantly, I think I'm going to make an appearance too. If you want to hang out and learn some more, uh, I definitely would make measurable steps towards becoming a member of some group somewhere so that you can begin to network with the right individuals. Guys, It's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.